hello, Chameleon Academy. Well, we had a very interesting start there. Well, as you may notice, I have a special guest in the house. Hello, Dr. Jan Sapala. Hi, Bill. Thanks very, very much for inviting me to your show. All right. So we have to say hello to everyone. Oh, we got Katrina from Texas. Eliza Ann. Eliza Ann, where are you from? Uh, Surf Panther is Ryan. And you're from Las Vegas, I think. Mikey Ben is from Canada. So, yeah, we've got an international group here. And it won't be long before the people from Finland start joining in and Portugal and Spain. So, yeah, we got a good. Oh, yeah. Inspector Gadget Howard's from Florida. And uh, hello, Marsha Ann. So, everybody, let me know where you're from. I we go, we got to let uh, Jan, Jan, who's from the UK, know he's in a good international company. Hey, two turtle Tom, James Cross. So, anyway, Jan, how's it over there in the UK? Uh, it's cool, uh, wet and windy. Uh, it's just typical for this part of the UK. Oh, that's that's what I'm used to from the UK. Yeah, so. it's okay. You know, we get patches of sunshine, and like a lizard, you have to rush out into it. <laughs> Because it's going to. Uh, you got a fellow UK here, Graham Frederick. Oh, yeah. All right. My San Graham. Bruno. All right, everybody. Uh, we have Jan for 30 minutes because he has parenting duties that he needs to get to. And so uh, I'd like to, if anybody has some uh, questions for Jan, go ahead and start putting mm -hmm. them in uh, the chat. I know usually we just all just have a grand old time here and hang out. But since he's got limited time, just want to know uh, if you have any specific questions for the author of Mountain Dragons, the most incredible book, and has been around Kenya. So this is an opportunity for us to learn about uh, from a real scientist that goes out into the real world. So let's see. Um, do, do, do we have a question? Oh, Germany's in the house. All right. Turtle so let's bomb. see. Tutorial Tom says. Oh. Yeah, yeah. there are many chameleon records immediately west and north of Nairobi. Those natural populations, are they Jackson I, Jackson I? Uh, so I think there's um, there are some records from the edge of the Rift Valley, which is a little bit west uh, of Nairobi. So I think the Ngong Hills um, does have Jackson I. Uh, that's right on the on the literally on the edge of the Rift. I think a place called Ah, Kijabe. Kijabe, I think, was listed as one of the most westerly populations, and that's right on the slope of the Rift Valley. And we did go there, but we didn't find Jackson. Um, and I am aware that there is another population of the Jacksons that is literally on that, that steep escarpment, uh, a, a currently unrecorded population that someone's told me about that I can't, I can't, I don't even know the location myself. But really, that escarpment is right on the edge of where they are um and i suppose the abadair the abadairs are almost part of that that edge as well so the abadairs are sort of a, a kind of westerly edge you know the the kinongot plateau would probably be one of the western limits as you go further north um and, and north of nairobi so so jacks and i occur apparently don't occur much south of nairobi city center so as you're transitioning north out of Nairobi, their population is continuous right up into the Abadares. So it's a kind of continuous gradation with the elevation going right up into the forests of the high Abadares. So, so that would explain their distribution in relation to Nairobi. And for the people wondering what we're talking about, Jackson's chameleons are found, uh, we're talking about Jackson's chameleons in Kenya. And there's two subspecies that live in Kenya. There's the Xanthalophus. That's the yellow crested, the one that you normally see. Everybody thinks about Jackson's as the Xanthalophus. But then there's another subspecies, Jacksoni Jacksoni. And this is a difficult thing because everything else is Jacksoni Jacksoni, where we know there's got to be, there's either, uh, we could, should either uh, spread them out as far as locales, maybe subspecies, maybe species. Uh, so yeah, we, we, it's scientists like Jan, we need help sorting these things out. Yeah. So, so quick answer, Xanthalophus, I had spoken to some local people that said Xanthalophus had appeared in Nairobi and I think those are translocations. So somewhere in the, um, near one of the sort of, um, going towards Karen from Nairobi center, going north of Nairobi, 
I heard that some Xanthalophus, uh, a guy that was into chameleons, has said they'd appeared in his local area, and he thinks they were probably introduced there. Quite why, I'm not sure. But anyway, Xanth shouldn't be close to Nairobi. They should really be on the south, southern and eastern side of Mount Kenya. Uh, Inspector Gadget. Well, hang on. Uh, sorry, oh, Mike. Okay. Uh, your question how long did it take to put the book together well when i started my research i was already photographing chameleons with the idea of the book so you could say that the project was also taking some time uh the, I, was, I was putting an additional time to photograph chameleons not just for the sake of the research but when i came down to sit when i finished my phd soon after i finished my phd i i bought myself a, a sort of professional graphics monitor and and in design software and i think that was about 18 months of quite hard work to get that to a a draft that was almost ready to go and then and then there was a sort of additional sort of to and froing with the publisher to sort of get the final formatting but about 18 months writing that book um okay jackson's in karura forest oh wait you want to go karura. i don't know where that forest is okay oops we may have a an internet freeze on jan's part uh but we'll wait for him to his internet to catch up and to come back on uh i'll say brukesia nana that's from madagascar that's a mark shirts area um uh -oh. oops well okay when he comes back on he can uh oh, he's back hi Ruby urban forest i mean i mean you, you get now you get jackson and I pretty close to the city center in on just just tall hedges normally they've got to be quite tall hedges like two to three meters tall and and you can find them in pretty urban environments i mean i've been sitting in cafes that were sort of surrounded by buildings and and there some i got sitting with a guy I spotted one over my shoulder on a bush and i've been in a bar that there was a barbecue in the bar where they were sort of frying meat for people to eat and in the tree above the barbecue there were a lot of flies and there was a jackson eye in that tree so they they do seem to in some of the parks like uhuru, uhuru park in sort of central nairobi there jackson eye there so they're they're around all over the city in in hedges actually and they, they've got quite urban all right genevieve is uh waiting for her mountain dragons to come in oh yeah <laughs> enjoy <laughs> and here's an interesting question <clears throat> We've heard about uh, Usuletai being uh, naturalized or found, even though they're not supposed to be. Yeah, that was um, that was in the Ngong Forest, I think, that they were supposedly, according to Stephen Spalls's field guide to East African reptiles. I think he he said that there might have been a naturalized population in the Ngong Forest, which is actually, I think on the way to the Ngong Hills. I can't remember if that's the name of the forest, but I, so I heard, I heard they were there and then I'd heard people have tried to look for them since and hadn't found them. They're certainly not a thriving, not what I'm aware of. No, I've not heard of anyone else find them apart from that one report. So I don't know whether that population is regarded as established or, or, or whether it may have died out. So, so this, as far as I'm aware, there's very little information and no photos. So I, I I don't know if those are Stiletti, but, it, but so that comment about um, differences in color, um, there's a paper recently been published on Jackson eye, uh, and they basically looked at the Jackson eye in Hawaii and compared them with the Jackson eye in, there was Anthelophus, or they regarded them as Anthelophus. So they, they looked at the Anthelophus in Hawaii and they looked at the Anthelophus in the eastern side of Mount Kenya and they did very careful color analysis and what they found is that the jackson eye in hawaii are more colorful uh, and they think because of the absence of predators that's a form of ecological release so in the wild you have predators so you can be colorful but if you get too colorful you could get eaten more easily so they think the absence of predators in hawaii has allowed jackson eye in hawaii to become more colorful that's the conclusion of their study so you can find that paper now it's been published recently um so so that kind of relates that question about the astoletti i wonder although i what do you remember and what do you mean by more colorful like the... so 
Males display sort of very vibrant colors when they're courting, sort of may, maybe more, more vibrant than might be useful for camouflage. Um, so display colors may be more vibrant. Uh, I, I haven't read the kind of nuts and bolts of the paper, but the conclusion seemed to be that where there is an absence of predators in Hawaii, that Jacks and I yeah. are more conspicuous, might be the way to describe it, okay. relative I, to their surroundings. I got it. So you look at some chameleons, the male courtship colors are incredibly vibrant. And you look at that and think, well, that's not a camouflaged animal. So there's, there must be a, the males must take a risk in showing courtship colors because they don't display them all the time as well. They often display them when they're only displaying to a female and then they show more subdued colors when they're not displaying, suggesting there might be a penalty to displaying bright colors all the time. Like maybe predators are more likely to predate you. So there's a cost to just displaying bright colors all the time. So maybe males switch them on when they need to and switch them off again. Uh, and maybe colors that are too bright, maybe there's a, an increased predation risk that you don't want to take. So th their, their theory is that the, there's a difference in coloration between Jackson Eye from Hawaii and, and the east side of Mount Kenya. And that, that may be down to uh, the absence of predation. That's the, I think that's okay. I'm right. Well, I tell you, the ones that I, I got from Kenya, those really were nice and bright. I, I thought they were brighter than the ones from Hawaii. So, uh, but of course, I yeah. have a much I mean, smaller uh, group to look at than they would. Yeah, yeah. I, I must admit, I need I need to sit down and read the paper in real detail. Okay. <laughs> um, so, if you teeth being raised on farms, or well, we we can go this. Or had you teased out any additional species since the book was published? So actually on the back of a communication with this guy who did the color study, uh, they've offered to do some genetic sequencing for me because they actually want to look at the genetic basis controlling color. Uh, and with this additional genetic data, I think we're going to go on to try and analyze and publish something on, on sort of genetic variation in Jackson eye across its range and, and hopefully tease out whether there might be something like called a cryptic species. Well, I think the one thing that came out of my study from my data, which is a bit more limited, it was mitochondrial data. So it's like looking at one gene. But what surfaced from that study was that the chameleons on Mount Meru are sufficiently genetically divergent and also with several unique morphological traits that is probably reasonable to describe Meru Montana as a separate species that that would be my opinion okay um but but we rather than just publish that um I think we're going to get this additional genetic data and then do that analysis so all right. whether there's anything else in amongst all of that I'm not sure um, all right so we have a question about trade uh, are they farm raised if they are coming in and what's your opinion of the trade? Is it sustainable? So when I was doing my research, I met a, a chameleon farmer on the Kinangot Plateau and that plateau is on the west side of, Nar of the Aberdeer Mountains. Um, and they have a very, really big facility there and it's in my book, photographs of this facility. So they have big enclosures, 80 almost 100 meters long by about 30 meters wide and you have sort of aisles of vegetation and then sort of walkways between them and and hundreds and hundreds of adult jacks and I in there um and then they leave bags of rotting fish out um and to attract the flies and they also send out little boys to catch grasshoppers to feed the chameleons um and that business has been going now for and, and their initial requirement was that they could catch chameleons from the wild, but they had, this is the Kenyan Wildlife Service had this requirement, they had to breed them to three generations before they could start selling them. Um, and then every time they have an export prepared, um, the Kenyan Wildlife Service or the National Museums of Kenya on their behalf would visit them and check the export. So it looks like it's a fairly well run operation. Uh, and they do, I think a lot of the animals that go into the United you know, I'm not 100% sure if all the animals coming out of Kenya from that farm. I've since heard that there are other operators in Kenya, but at least I know that business that exports to Europe. Um, I don't know how much they export to the US. That's how it's run. So it's a sort of self-contained breeding operation. But, but even if the chameleons are wild caught, they are living 
in a lot of agricultural landscapes and they're often quite abundant and um, i think that abundance is partly the abundance of food because when you get flowering crops you get a lot of invertebrates so that probably creates a super abundance of food more so maybe than you get in the wild um, and also there's an absence of predators like snakes and hornbills in things like coffee plantations and so i think chameleons may possibly be more abundant in these agricultural landscapes than in natural habitat mm. um so it means that if you're going out collecting them you know there are there's a female may have depending on the species or like jack's night 20 young at a time may breed two or three times in their lifetime so if there's good survival of those those young animals um the potential for the population to recover from collecting is is there Oh, looks like we got uh, got the internet uh, freezing again. Yeah, one thing we we talked about in the interview is how uh, with the coffee plantations, uh, the the uh, Jacks and I at least have really been able to uh, move in and uh, and populate in there. And one uh, one thing about what happens when we go off and we create this this area for crops is we take away some natural predators uh we don't like snakes around when we're walking around our crops uh and they're uh, we're taking away the trees for the hornbills and so the predators are now uh are now not not there and uh let me tell you i got uh one jackson's female and, and i wasn't uh, i wasn't um I wasn't stuffing her with food uh, and she gave me 50 babies. So it, it, I am nervous whenever there isn't oversight over a, a particular species, because then the, uh, the ability for them to be abused and over collected is, is there, but at least with Jackson, I, there is a quota. So it is CITES, uh, it is CITES, uh, supervised. So um, I, I think we've got a good solid situation and a sustainable situation with at least the Jackson's chameleon. Um, uh, so yeah, now in Madagascar, we, we got issues in Madagascar. So let's see. You know, when Jan comes on, we'll go ahead and have him explain this, the difference between the species and subspecies. Yeah, that's that's a mess. That is a yawn question. And if he's able to come back on, we're going to give that to him. Let's see, what is the normal nocturnal temperature for Jackson and I in the wild? There's been studies to show how climate change is impacting those nightly temperatures. I can say we talked about the nighttime temperatures uh, on the podcast and how it gets a lot colder for the Xanthalophus on the higher elevations than it does for the Machacos Hills. Uh, but then again, we don't know if there's a difference in the Jacksons as to whether they can, number one, tolerate it, or number two, are needing that. Uh, because if they just can tolerate it, it's not a difference. And you know what? I've taken both Xanthalovis and Machacos Hills down pretty cold into the uh, easily into the 40s, and they both do fine. But uh, I, I know I am a, a poor substitute for answering for Jan. Uh, I'm just waiting, <laughs> hoping he comes. Um, doo -doo. Hey, he's back. My computer died. It just froze entirely. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. Well, we have this uh, question. Difference between species and subspecies uh so species uh it's a big question so species you imagine to be uh non-reproducing populations two different types of organism in the same habitat and they're not reproducing together you can easily say they're species um the question becomes more complicated when they're geographically isolated so they they, they look different but they're on you know the you can't test whether they're going to breed with each other. So you have to kind of infer it from 
ecological data, morphological data. You know, there was the kind of idea of describing species by morphology. Uh, and then over time, people start to incorporate genetic data. Um, and where you have different species, different populations and different mountains or different isolated populations, you can at least say they're discrete. And then maybe if they have a distinct differences in morphology, you might say, well, they represent good species. Or maybe if they're genetically very distinct, you might say you know, they've been isolated for so long, even though they're not very different. They're separate evolutionary lineages that they should be called species. Um, things like, say, Xanthilophus and Jackson eye, they probably were isolated for a period of time. They diverged over that time, and then they've come into contact again, those populations. And the evidence so far seems to suggest they hybridize where they meet. So there's been a degree of divergence, but now they're hybridizing. And therefore, you say there's, you describe them as subspecies because. In the core of their ranges, they show discrete morphological traits, but where they meet, they hybridize, and the divergence hasn't been sufficient for speciation to occur, as in reproductive isolation. So, so in terms of Jackson and I, that'd be a case case in point. Um, it's not always All easy right. to, to pick out species. <laughs> All right, we're going to have this one last question here uh, because we have six more minutes with Jan. I'm going to go on afterwards, so, but with Jan. Uh, so at the lower <clears throat> elevate, so if you're in Nairobi, um, where Jackson and I found, I guess the nights could be, could be in the warmer part of the year, could be like as warm as like 18, 20 degrees at night. Um, and then, and then, on, and the, actually Bill was asking me about that to do with Machakos, Jackson and I, Xanthilophus. So, Normal nighttime temperatures around about 10 degrees. Is it 15 degrees in Machakos? And, and I think for Xanthilophus, around about 10 degrees it can go down to, but as low as three or four for Xanthilophus. Um, even Nairobi can get pretty chilly at night, but there are populations up to like 3,000 meters, and up there you've got frosts and temperatures down to, you know, occasionally minus, minus two, minus three. So depending on where they're found, the temperatures can get sub-zero, you know, that, and, the animal, and they are able, if it's not too cold, or if they find a sheltered spot, they're not going to freeze. I think once it goes below about six, seven degrees, they're going to freeze, and, but, but they seem to be found to the upper limits of the tree line where it's, you know, gets to sub-zero sub temperatures, but down at the lower elevations around Nairobi, you're looking at normal nighttime temperatures of 10, 15 degrees, same for Xanthalopus, possibly. So... All right, everybody, we are going to have to uh, let uh, let Jan go. Uh, he has. For Sorry all the... about that. Uh, it's okay. I'm just glad you could come on. Uh, everybody, Jan is the author of Mountain Dragons, and this is an incredibly beautiful book. Uh, you're going to see pictures of chameleons you've never seen before. And, uh, and I haven't seen a lot of these. I haven't ever seen them since. And so... I encourage you, you can get it at dragonstrand.com. And uh, Jan has just a, a a handful of boxes left of these books. So declining numbers. <laughs> and uh, and by the way, he signs every one. So we uh, we we get signed signed books. So all right, everybody, I want to yeah, sorry I can't answer all your questions. Um, thanks very much for uh for asking the questions that you have it's nice nice to chat to people that are interested um maybe bill might invite me back on another time I'll, I'll help yeah and i'll help on some of these questions i know the answers to some of yeah, these okay. but, yeah oh yeah yeah Jan, you're you're always welcome here yeah, all right cool. go well, take care of your yeah uh, your child, child. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll nice see you Jan. i'll see you around yeah all right bye then all right everybody uh Yes. Okay. Question about is uh, tutorial. Tom says is Jackson I Jackson I more widely distributed than Zans? This is the the challenge. The answer is yes, but the challenge is that Jackson I Jackson I includes all these different locales that are all over the place that nobody has sorted out yet. And so uh, once they sort it out, you could have five different species uh, subspecies at least in there. Uh, and so Jackson, I, Jackson, I right now is just like a, they just, 
it's just got so many different things in it. Uh, when we call, <laughs> when we call uh, the reason why we call that colorful one the Machacos Hills, Jackson's Chameleon, is because it comes from the Mach Machacos Hills, and it is more precise to call it Machacos Hills, Jackson's Chameleon, than it is Tarasaurus Jacksonii Jacksonii. This is one of the few cases where the common name is actually better than the scientific name. Uh, it's a it's a strange anomaly, but that's that's where it goes. Um, let's see. All right, uh, everybody, it is time for chameleons and coffee, and you know I'm going to do something special. And yes, I've uh, I've gone to uh, went to the reptile show, and so I'm going to show you what I got from the show. But first, everybody, let's get your coffee today is going to be a combination of Starbucks cold brew and Mexican Coke. You ever remember, ever remember uh, Coke Black? Yeah, well, that's what it's going to be today. <laughs> We're going to see what this tastes like. Ooh, that's interesting. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Um, okay. Now, as you know, around here we had the uh, the reptile. Sh oh, by the way, yeah, uh, just about uh, the Jan. There's an interview that I did with Jan that I just released yesterday. That um, that was about the differences between uh, the Machacos Hills Jackson's chameleons. That's the bright, colorful one, and the uh, the Xanthelophus, the yellow crested, which is the larger one that's more common, they come from different areas in Kenya. And the question was, should we be keeping them differently? And so uh, go, go ahead, take uh, that. It's a podcast and the, the interview is on YouTube as well. So you can uh, go listen to me asking Jan these questions. And the important part about it, uh, <laughs> the important part about it is that we're asking the questions that we think we know the answer. I've kept uh, Machacos Hills and the Xanthelophus identically for many years. I've produced multiple generations. And so it would be very easy for me to say, I know the answer and, uh, and stay and be done with it. But you know how we do things in the Chameleon Academy. We question everything we think we know. And uh, this is no exception. And so I said, hey, wait a minute. But is that true? If I kept them, my Checo seals a little bit different, would they do better? And that's, that's when, you, when you treat this like an art, you don't stop when you say, okay, that's good enough. You keep going. And so that's what we did. And uh, spoiler alert, we found out uh, that you can keep them identically. And we explained why the pictures in the book show that Machacos, the hills outside of Machacos, look a lot different than the area that the Xanthelophus were coming from. And we ex we get to the bottom of why that is. And that's, that's what's important. So uh, let's see. Graham has a little JD. He's got he's got a more interesting combination than I do. Jack Daniels, I'm assuming. So let's see. Uh, let's see if I can show you. By the way, uh, give me this. Yvette, yeah. would you be able to get that new T-shirt that I got today? I need to show everybody. So let's see. I don't know if you're going to be able to see, but these are my hmm, my powder orange isopods. I do two types of isopods, I do powder orange, and then I do dairy cows. I love dairy cows. It's like, they are so common. They are the most common ones, but I I think they are the best. I love them. I love them very much. That's it. You wanna say hello to everybody? Sure, I know that you put me on the spot. Yeah, I gotta put you on the spot. Who's my Betty? Say hello, oh, everybody. Hey, where am I? There you go. Hey, I'm like all like in. There we Hi. go. There we go. Here's my hair. There we go. How are you? <laughs> Have a good one, guys. That's my Betty. So, all right. So, look what I got. Got my Trap Talk podcast. I got this from the show. The coolest reptile podcast in the world. What the heck? What the heck? 
I got to figure out how you get to be the coolest reptile podcast in the world. Tried so hard for eight years and they get the award. What the heck is that all about? That's okay. Just kidding. I love, I love every uh, reptile podcast. I think it's great that we have more people, more people getting in the podcast game uh, because doing a podcast is really, really, really cool. So, okay. Anybody have any questions uh, that I can answer about uh, Jan Jackson's The Show? Chameleons. Let's see if I've got something else. Went ahead and decided I'm I'm going to be uh, putting a little bit more into my dubia colony to just kind of spike it up because I've been feeding them off a lot. And uh, so I got some more dubia. Uh, I have found that I'm having a little bit of trouble getting the production of my dubia because uh, my temperature is too low. So let's see. Howard is saying, <laughs> talking about species. Getting my Indian nomenclature and both species and subspecies go on to the end of time. Yeah, and that's something everybody keeps uh, keeps looking looking on uh, working on. Okay, James, my grasshoppers. I don't know they're mating. At least that I don't have any babies yet, but they're mating. So th this is a good idea. Or this is a it's working. I hope. Are there any Jackson I Jackson I locales people are working with? No, there isn't. Uh, every now and then I hear about the possibility of one come in, but oh, okay. Well, maybe I should say. Um, occasionally we will get in the variety that comes from Nairobi, and that's because they're just so easy to get a hold of. And the when people are gathering Jacksonia Jacksonii because. There are farms in Kenya, and then there are land, uh, large tracts of land that are privately owned and designated as farms. Um, and I'm not sure exactly the legalities of all of that, but all I can tell you is uh, we do get in some forms of Jacksonia, Jacksonia that are not from, uh, that, that do not originate from Machacos Hills, the Machacos Hills. But uh, the thing is, the some of the other locations are a lot are either on national parks, or are much harder to uh, access, or else are much uh, are of a much higher elevation. And the problem with higher elevations is they need that nighttime drop and the cool temperatures, and so they are difficult to uh, keep. Uh, in captivity, unless you're specifically making an area just for them. Now, I imagine I could do it because I have a cool area, uh, but uh, th that's the situation. Um, we don't see a whole lot of other ones. And the thing is, it's really hard to compete with the colors of the Machacos Hills, Jackson's Chameleon, that are much easier to get a hold of. So it's like, why work harder for something that will be less desired? Um, there's a lot of subtle things that those of us who love chameleons would really appreciate, like the blue-eyed Jackson's chameleon that you see in Young's book. But uh, as far as general appeal, the large Xanthalophus and the colorful Machacos Hills kind of covers it all. See, Howard asked about Brookesia nana is because they look so amazing at their small size. Yes, they do. They do. Uh, they are incredible. Although Jan is, is Kenyan, he, his experience is in Kenya. Uh, I, I will Eventually, I will have Mark Schertz back on and we can ask him. He's, he actually works on naming these things. So, hmm. Ah. Uh. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so I want to ask everybody here, how much do you guys do with 3D printing? Okay. As you know, I'm I'm actually I have a class. Where is it? All our stuff. I'm doing a class on 3D printing to teach people how to use 3D printing and get involved with it themselves. I'm looking for all my stuff. Where's my 3D printed stuff? But um, and so I'm wondering how many of you out there 
have 3D printers that you make stuff for your reptile cages? Uh, let me know in the chat. I'd be very interested uh, to learn how diverse, uh, how many people in the community are already working with 3D printing. Yeah, I have had such a great time with 3D printing. I have made so many good things and I love it. And I think everybody should have one. Let's see. It's the cooler temperature from thinner air at higher elevation. So in the wild, they need the cooler air because cool air has more oxygen. Um, don't think so. I don't think it has to do with the amount of oxygen. And the only reason I say that is because we are able to keep them healthy just by changing the temperature. And I mean, nobody's, nobody's working on the different uh, the oxygen saturation. It's an interesting idea, though. I, I'd never considered that, uh, but we can uh, something to look into. But we've been able to make it work just by changing the temperature. And Mike said, "Ready to get one? Just now waiting for your class." Excellent. Yes, Mikey's signed up there, uh, and what he's talking about is this. Uh, so I made made the class. Uh, reptile keeping for uh, our 3D printing for reptile keepers. And if you want to join up, it's a paid class. It's going to be on uh, four consecutive Saturdays starting next Saturday. And you go to chameleonacademy.com and you can sign up for the class. And it's going to go over the terminology for 3D printing and all the, the aspects of 3D printing. Uh, second class is going to be how to choose a 3D printer. You got all these specs all over the place and different models what's important about them. And the third one is going to be about 3D design software. So CAD design software. And the fourth one is going to be about uh, actually producing product and deciding to sell it or give it out for free, however you do it. So this is uh, a class about getting reptile keepers involved with 3D printing. If you're interested in 3D printing, uh, I'm going to be doing this live, just like we are right now. It's going to be over Zoom. And I'm going to be uh, presenting and there for a completely uh, complete interaction. So uh, question and answer as we go along. So uh, I encourage you. I would love it for everybody to come to this class. It's the first time I've been giving a, a digital class. Uh, well, okay. I've done other like seminar webinars and stuff, but this is, uh, this is my first class. And so uh, uh, in this format, so I would love it. It'd be great to have uh, you all join, but at least Mikey's going to be there. And we got, uh, uh, yes, there are there are some people signed up. Let's see. Graham's camera. As some cams need lower temperatures, can some get by with ambient temperatures? I didn't need direct infrared radiation. I don't understand the question here. Are you talking about uh, the different wavelengths of light? Uh, when you're talking about can get by with ambient temperatures, they need the low temperatures at night, the nighttime drop at night and cool temperatures during the day. Maybe I don't understand exactly the question. You can, um, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead and clarify the question. Feeder cups, frams, yes, the frams cam feeder cups are 3D printed. Yeah. I'm interested in 3D printing, but find polyurethane resin casting a more efficient way of producing my product. What is your product? Generally, the, the resin uh, is for smaller, more detailed things. Uh, what What is your product and why is the resin uh, better than the 3D printing? Uh, let me, I'd be interested in, in knowing that. How is your 3D part you created many months ago? I am finalizing all of them because as I said, I'm going to be having a section in my uh, in my uh, chameleon journal that uh, every, every issue is going to have a 3D printed project. And so that's going to be my, uh, that is, I'm, it's going to be necessary for me to finish 
every project, one, one, every other month, I need to finish one of those projects to the point where uh, I can uh, send it out to the world. I've been interested in 3D printing for quite a while. Hold stock in a 3D printing company. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Electronically conductive devices right off. All right, let's see. Marsha Ann is using the resin printer for cricket feeders. Okay, that's a larger, a larger product. Why would you, why, why did you pick uh, resin over the 3D printing? Uh, is it, you're just looking for a better finish? Because, uh, or, or do you have an, an extra large resin printer? Or, yeah, help me understand uh, why you chose resin. Background temps, can that be enough via direct shortwave infrared? Okay, you're talking on a, you're talking about the, Graham, I'm sorry, I am not getting the context of your question. Background temps, um, I, I don't, okay, I'm going to have to learn, get a, bit more of an idea of what you're talking about as far as uh, temperatures. Uh, as for, uh, all I know about the the nighttime temperatures, you know, are you talking about like the night sky, the, the dark night sky? Or am I putting things in, uh, reading things into it? Um, all I do with temperature is use the air conditioner to get it down. But uh, I am interested in... Uh, getting more of an idea of what you you're talking about here. And Marsha likes resin because of time. Okay, that's a good enough reason. Good enough reason, especially if anybody wants to produce uh, produce things to sell on Etsy or whatever. It does take a while. It takes uh, every one of those little cup holders will take hours and for me. And if I want to produce five of my cup holders, uh, I can take the entire day. So, uh, but I, I like the ability to produce uh, much larger product, uh, much larger items. And for that, uh, 3D printing is more e uh, effective. But um, anyway. Does anybody else actually work with 3D printing? Is uh, by the way, it's it's very addictive, very addictive because you can essentially just create anything, and then have it print out. It's something out of Star Trek, and so I think you all need to, I think you all need to try it. Uh, it's a, it's a, a disruptive technology that uh, it. I, I think it's the most disruptive technology since the smartphone. That's my personal. Uh, feeling on it. And then the uh, one before that would be internet. So, uh, okay, Graham, Graham's trying very hard to help me figure this out. Just say you have a warm room and a heat lamp would be too much. Okay. All right. We'll go with it. We, we need to have this discussion maybe offline where I can figure out the context of that question. Uh, so, but uh, uh, but this uh, this week I will be working on finishing up the class uh, uh, 3D printing for reptile keepers. And if anybody is interested in learning about uh, 3D printing and wants, I, I'm going to assume absolutely no background. So I'm going to start you off from ground zero, literally knowing nothing about 3D printing. I'm going to tell you what it is. And then I'm going to handhold you through actually selecting a 3D printer. And today they are basic to the point where uh, it's very easy to put them together, very easy to uh, get them working. And it's, I mean, really the most intimidating thing is figuring out the order that you've got to do everything. Um, And Marsh says, I love creating things. would love to learn 3D printing, whether for chameleons or not. If you are using a resin printer, then you, you already know everything you need to know. You just, you just need a different machine. Uh, so yeah, you, you're already set. You're already set. And 
I mean, there's a lot of different materials and uh, larger size you can use, but yeah, yeah, you already know what to do. Uh, about 3D or resin printing, perfect branches to put in the enclosure. Um, sure. The one, the challenge we have here is the, like the 3D printing, you have a build volume of about eight inches by eight inches by eight inches. Uh, and every, every um, uh, printer has a different build volume, but th that's, a, that's a good standard. And so if you want to make a branch that goes from one end of the cage to the other, you got to build it so it can connect together. Uh, and so, uh, but you can do it. You can do it. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we haven't gotten to the point where we can make two foot, have a build volume of two foot by two foot. Okay, I take that back. Yes, those do exist. But uh, they're thousands and thousands of dollars to get something that works that big. So, uh, you know, if you go for around anywhere from two to five hundred dollars, or even up to a thousand dollars, you're talking about uh, just over two hundred millimeters, two hundred millimeters by two hundred millimeters, and uh, that's a general range. And uh, but uh, the uh, the branches, yeah, I I mean, I like to make, well, you, you've seen what I've made. Cup holders, uh, plant holders, uh, uh, misting nozzle inputs, uh, fogger inputs, uh, cage standoffs, uh, even lighting standoffs. So you have your, uh, your UVB light. You want it three inches above your cage? Well, you make three-inch standoffs. All you got to do is put it into your 3D CAD machine. And I mean, I could put that in and I could design something in half an hour and then print it out in a couple of hours. And uh, be, uh, in an afternoon, I've created some standoffs for my UVB light that give me the exact UV index that I want in my basking branch. And it is specifically made for the lights I have and the cage I have. So it's uh, very, very cool. It, it gives us so much uh, ability to really work on our husbandry and make it perfect, uh, as perfect as we can. And I understand the resin thing. You can make any mold. Would love a 3D printer, though. And, and the thing about 3D printing is it's, uh, uh, it's so, it's gotten affordable, like, the $200 machine, you can do it for, uh, get a $200 machine. And if they're on sale, it can be a under $100. And it's so accessible. Now, I tend to like the machines that are in the five to $800 range because they, they include things like an enclosure. Um, and if you want to do some materials, like uh, the materials that we have to work with, uh, aren't necessarily UV resistant. Uh, one of the one of the materials that will can be used at the lower temperatures, lower nozzle temperatures, is PET G, and that has some UVB resistance. But when you really want something that can go for outdoor use, they have something called ASA, and, and you'll get used to all these uh, acronyms <laughs> for the different uh, materials. Uh, and that thing needs a higher nozzle temperature, and so it's a more expensive uh, unit. Um, now, the question is, is PET-G at the normal nozzle temperature of what, 260 uh, Celsius, is that good enough for our chameleon cages? And I'm working on figuring out the answer to that. I have a number of things that I'm testing uh, because in our chameleon cages, it's, it's actually low UVB. When uh, when people think about outdoor, they're thinking about UV index of 10, 13, whatever, and being blasted all afternoon. So we actually don't do that, even though we have UVB in our cages. So uh, it's interesting. It, it's experience. I mean, we in the reptile community need to experiment, even though 3D printing is, is a pretty mature uh, um, technology. 
we still have to uh, figure it out for our specific niche. And, uh, and I, I, I do some of that. I'm working on that. <laughs> it's in process, but there's, there's so many people that are working on uh, the shop, uh, Summer Winston, who was on here. Uh, Summer works with the 3D printing, making the the, uh, the Camellia feeder run cups and, and other products. And Framscams is doing it. There's a number of people on Etsy who are making things for reptiles. So this is just starting and you can, uh, you can do it too. You can do it too. And that's the thing. This is just starting for us. Uh, Surf Panther's going to get one. We want to make some dart frog laying. Yeah, yeah. Tiny, tiny ponds for eggs. There you go. And if you can't find 35 fil millimeter film cases, now you can print them. So, so come to my class. But uh, I, actually, you, <laughs> so uh, yeah, you're, uh, I, once you have one, you realize how incredibly cool they are. And you say, yeah, okay. I see, I see, <laughs> I see why people love this. But, uh, uh, and I'll be talking a little, a lot more about 3D printing on my Reptile Entrepreneur podcast. And so if any of you are interested in some of the technologies behind uh, keeping reptiles and the people who are creating things, like the last interview I had was with uh, Colby uh, um, Jingles, who, may, who did Thrive Ecosystems. He designed and is now manufacturing his own LED lights because he wanted something that had a broader spectrum. And so uh, this, this, the Reptile Entrepreneur is such a fascinating uh, podcast that I do because it's about the people who are creating businesses in the reptile community. And just to see what everybody does is uh, inspiring and amazing. And I love doing it. So, all right, everybody. I want to say thank you very much for joining me. Uh, if you want, if you're interested in 3D printing and taking the class, it's a paid class. It's $80 for four consecutive Saturdays and live instruction on uh, on those Saturdays. And you can sign up, check out the class on communalandacademy.com. Go to the homepage and there's this big sign that says reptile uh, 3D printing for reptile keeping. Um, other than that, I want to say, let's go ahead and put on your, uh, your last, uh, last questions. And I will, I will finish my coffee and Coke. Mm -hmm. All right, Mikey, James, thank you all for joining me. And so I'll go ahead and sign off here. Uh, next time I'm going to be live is uh, Tuesday, Tuesday at uh, 5 p.m. Pacific on Instagram. So, hey, Marsha, thank you very much for joining. I, uh, I love love hearing about your resin printing. Uh, that's, that's excellent. I'm going to go, let's see, you call them Neymar's cricket feeding feeder. All right. I'm going to take a look. I'm going to try to find that, see where I can find that. Graham, thank you for coming in and, uh, we'll see you all next time.